Welcome to this Talks at Google virtual event. I am Jacqueline Serrano, and I am on the Latin music and content strategy team for YouTube Music at Google. Before we get started, I want to remind the audience that we will be taking questions toward the end of this talk. As you think of questions throughout this conversation, please be sure to add them to the live chat on the right. I am very excited to introduce today's guest, Villana Santiago Pacheco, known by her stage name, Villano Antillano. Villano Antillano has been one of the pioneers of the queer movement within the urban genre in Puerto Rico. Born in Bayamón, Villano Antillano considers herself a trans femme woman whose approach to music is as challenging and irreverent as it is magnetic and revolutionary. As an audio visual artist, she is the true owner del flow y del chanteo. Her songs go beyond the trap and urban genres. They are revealing lyrics that tell the beauty and also some of the horrors of growing up as a queer person in the Caribbean. Additionally, Villana is the first trans artist in the world to reach the top 50 Spotify global charts. And today she is the most listened to artist who is trans in the world. Villana, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Talks at Google. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Como estas? Bien, bien. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is tr my true pleasure to host you in conversation and be able to shine a light on your beautiful artistry and everything that you've shared with us and to your fans, you know, in the past uh, couple of years. Thank so you let's, for having me. No, no. Thank you for being here. First off, let's talk about your growth in the music scene. This uh, Over the last year, you've seen tremendous growth. Um, how are you feeling today? looking back at everything that has happened from December 2020 to now, how has that happened? How has that been for you? You know, it's been very crazy because um, <clears throat> it's been a lot of work. You know, a lot of people don't, a lot of people might think or might see that the afuera que it might look like, ah, like these things happen overnight and they most certainly do not. Um, and it's crazy for me now because I'm in Madrid right now finishing my album and I just actually flew in to Madrid from Paris Fashion Week. And it's like, you know, these whole like different ropes that I'm getting to and, and playing. But um, I'm still the same, you know, girl. And like two years ago, I was still like home, broke, um, not knowing like what I was going to do or where I was going to get my next like plate a meal from or like you know my, my next hot meal from or how I was gonna pay rent um I come from a very difficult place to live in in the world um I come from a colony I think not a lot of people can say that and you know because there's not a lot of colonies left there shouldn't exist any uh but being a colony is something that's really like just it it makes you go through certain hardships and I feel like um I'm very proud of where Puerto Ricans in general are and where I've been able to like take my community you know because at the end of the day I feel like I make music for everyone and obviously I have like cisgender people who like entirely like fuck with my music and love me and like cisgender females and that's actually like my biggest crowd but um I originally like you know make music for maricones and like my queer community and like that's the standard for me but it's so high that everybody else is like Oh my God, that's really dope. Let's get into this. And so, yeah, I'm, I just feel very blessed at the end of the day of like, I can't really believe it, but it's also been so much work throughout. I, I haven't stopped. There's a lot to be done, so. For sure. As you know, we don't really have a lot of Latino LGBT folks in music in general, menos en rap, menos en reggaeton. When did you first, when did it first click? Like, I'm gonna do this. Um, being a rapper, I feel like that came much later. Like, I feel like, but I knew I was going to be doing something related to music somehow, in some way. I grew up very musically inclined, and I feel like everyone in Puerto Rico can say that. Like, or I feel like anyone that's like Latinx or Hispanic even can just like feel that, you know, like when you're, when, when your mom's cleaning La Casa, there's music, and you're, you're cooking, there's music, everything has music to it. So um, I grew up knowing that, you know, like music was a very big part of me and I loved it so, so, so much. Um, later, obviously, you know, um, I didn't really realize I was um, queer until I like grew up and realized what being queer was. And I just knew I was a little weird. 
<laughs> and uh, people like to like fuck with me or like make fun of me or whatnot because I was very effeminate and I was very out there and like I also had five sisters so it's like you know it wasn't that like far-fetched but um I guess later in life like all these things clicked and like these intersectionalities I never really set out to be like a queer icon or like represent like because at the end of the day, my my gender identity has nothing to do with who I am as a musician and like how skilled I am. Just the same way that like me being a woman has nothing to do with how skilled I can be at any job that I choose to do or that I am good at or any field that it possibly exists known to man. So um, these are conversations that we shouldn't be having, but there's obviously, you know, they are important because sadly the world makes it so that we need to like punctualize and you know like label things and so we can understand what being a woman is like and we can understand oppression and we can understand what being a minority is uh so at the end of the day when like all these things converged i'm still just like a girl that's following a dream regardless of like how you look at it and well that came later with the fact that you know like okay well she's a trans woman and this has never been done before because trans women, I've never even like had a trans female doctor like treat me. And that's always blown my mind because there are no trans doctors because we don't get there, at least where I come from, because oh. trans women don't get there because we, they, there are so many obstacles in the way. The average lifespan of trans females where I come from or of trans women where I come from is 35 years. I'm about to be 28 soon. So that means I have like seven years left. You know, it's crazy. There's a lot of things that are stacked against us. So I feel like when you look at those things separately and then you can understand like, okay, wow. And she inserted herself into the most um, misogynist genre known to mankind at the moment. Um, Cause I feel like music is just, I feel like in a way just naturally misogynist because like men control like the industry, you know? So like, no matter, I bet you like there's, misogyny even in like fucking like Beethoven's time you know because they probably like, no you're a woman you can't play the flute you can't do that so I guess come on get when you look at all of these things then yeah you know come on get, but they, it was never in my head it was just like I know I can do this and I know um I'm good at rapping and I know I'm like I, I want to be better and I want to produce music and I want to make art so I'm just gonna set out to do that and then obviously well it's I'm inescapably trans um even if I'm like super super like gorge i just like this is there you can hear it in that voice <laughs> but you know i guess that's when it all comes together and it's like it, it can be like an inspiring thing but i never it never really clicked for me until i became the first one wow you are definitely one of the first for sure is there yeah. any artist or lgbtq influencer celebrity person of any career that you look up to or that has inspired you? Yes, the um, wow, like a lot of queer people inspire me, but also I, and I am gonna get into like the celebrities because it's definitely there. But um, I also like to talk about how my friends inspire me and how like, yes. I'm not, mm, I'm not more of, you know, cause people use these big labels like activist or I don't consider myself an activist or, you know, like icon. And I don't think I'm more of an icon than my trans friend who works at an office and has to clock in nine to five and deal with trans misogyny on the daily by herself, you know? And like, and is sticking it up for like trans people in that company or in the government or wherever she works. So, or I'm not more of an icon than my trans friend who is a sex worker, you know? I feel like those are the icons and those are the women that inspire me. Uh, yeah, and I always like to like remind people of that. And um, in regards to like celebrities, I feel like the most like the biggest one. I always have to like if if I'm talking about home, she is a cisgender woman. But Iris Chacon for me was like when I realized it was like, oh my god, I'm seeing this. I mean, and I wasn't even alive when she when like the show was televised. But my grandma would tell me stories of how my grandfather would stop and everything he was doing, but I'd show the Iris Chacon. And he would sit down and watch until the Chacon. And I started, you know, when YouTube came along, I started looking into it. And it is Chacon for me is like the epitome of like um 
you know, that 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 art of cabaret and like, bueno, La Vede de America, you know, that's what she was called. And she's one of like my biggest inspirations, like just aesthetically, the way she danced, the way she moved, the way she was so sensual in such a conservative time in such a time when it wasn't allowed. And to me, she is one of like the most important Puerto Rican artists of all time. Uh, but, you know, more, I guess, tied to me as a woman, as a trans woman, uh, Cristina La Veneno. <clears throat> who is yes. Spanish and I'm in, mm -hmm. in Spain right now and it's been so crazy for me to be here and for me to like make my music and for me to like receive the love that I receive and for people to like run after me in the streets because you know it's like Cristina when I when I when I first saw her and when I first heard about her her story the series that exists now and is available on HBO, which you should all watch, Veneno, please. It's, it's incredible. cinematographically amazing incredible. and it's just so beautifully done. Um, before that came out, like I read the book and I had discovered her in like YouTube, just like the algorithm. The algorithm fed her to me. The algorithm knew I was a transsexual woman and she was like, you know what? <laughs> ella, ella tiene que ver like, este video. And she put her on my feet and I'm like, oh my God. So I clicked on it and I was just like, what? And I started looking into it and I loved her so much. And I love like, you know, the story and it's, it's, it's tragic and I'm not gonna like get into it. So you guys can watch the the show, but um, she really, really did that for me of like unlocking um, and I had trans friends by then, you know but she really did that for me of unlocking like the fact that like Oh my God, wait, like I can do it. I can, I can transition. She was 30 when she transitioned and I was 25 when I discovered her. Well, like I guess 24 ish, but I turned 25 when I started my transition. And for me, it was like, she became like a bombshell and it was like, oh my God, wait, 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 wait. I don't have to wait. Cause before that I used to be like, okay, my, my thought process as a trans person and remember like no trans person, like transitions the same or even transitions you know we all have different like ways of expressing our transness but in my case it was like she kind of like knocked on my door and said like hey it's not too late because i used to say like oh in my next life i'll be a really 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 badass woman and then like when i saw and when i ran into christina's story it was like oh my god first of all i didn't even know that like i could be like trans because you don't really you don't really grow up like seeing trans people anywhere, yeah. especially not in Puerto Rico where I'm from and El Monte de Bayamón bien medio. Like I had never seen a trans person until I was like at least well into my twenties, and I was definitely like queer, and that was like you know um, evident. And I like had my friends in the community, but um, I hadn't really realized that I could do it until I, I saw her story. So definitely, Cristina La Veneno, and I will say it everywhere I go. That is so powerful. Power. That is so powerful and beautiful that you met. I was actually going to bring La Veneno up because I feel like Latinos in general, we don't see these stories unless we kind of seek these stories. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously your testimony is, is evident that it's very powerful, you know, to see people that broke barriers because definitely La Veneno mm -hmm. is one of those. Um, in the way that, you know, it could really be powerful in the way that we identify and our self-expression. What do you think, yeah. how do you think the Latino community can be better in highlighting these stories? Because even Iris Chagon, I'll tell you right now, I grew up in LA, Mexican family. I don't know her story. So now I'm like, okay, why don't I know her story? You know? You have to look into her. Everyone exactly. who's on this, you have to look into Iris Chagon. It's amazing. Like the level of artistry yeah. is just, you know, you know what it is? She was a female in a time where, you know, like it was just, she was just the entertainment. Yeah. That's all she was. She was the entertainment for like the men and, you know, like the show, but she had her own show and the choreographies were top notch. Her wow. physique, her like aesthetic, everything she did. And like even the musical numbers, the music that she made, she made wonderful music and she's not credited as, um, a wonderful artist in Puerto Rico. Like very few people like actually like listen to her music. And I obviously sat down and I listened to like her entire discography. She has amazing, amazing, amazing things. And I think the, the Latinx community, but basically, you know, I have problems with this term as well because, you know, there's a lot of things that 
the Latino community chooses not to speak on. Mm -hmm. uh, among those things is uh, machismo, is misogyny, is racism. Uh, and I, I have my, you know, I, I have my my issues with the term because I've seen a lot of people hide behind the, the Latino sticker to mm -hmm. be like, you know, colorist and racist and, you know, like say, oh, we're all like a melting pot and it's, that's not true, you know, and we all don't, li don't live the same experiences. So I think the Latino community has to start being a little bit more honest about the conversations that we need to start having. And I feel like these conversations, uh, you know, we're very, we're very familiar as Latino people, you know, we, we gather around for la fiesta and we gather around para comer, para beber, con los tíos, las tías, los abuelos. And it's, you know, it, it's time that the men specifically start taking like time to talk about these things because it's not even like at this point, women don't, I don't have to educate you. I don't have to like go to a family party and like explain and educate and lecture you on what, you know, like, transphobia is and how you're replicating it and how you're being transphobic towards me i don't have to do that and i don't do that and actually like as an adult i estranged myself from a lot of my family because uh, frankly like i don't give a fuck <laughs> but you know como que, there's a lot of people out there who who, who suffer and yeah. i didn't you know and now i'm a 27 year old woman like I'm good. I'm, I'm grown. I'm a professional. I don't need anything from anyone. But when it wasn't so, you know, and I was vulnerable and I was a little girl, I really, you know, it, it would have been great to have like a, a family that was more conscious that, you know, like none of these things matter. What matters is that you are part of the family, that we love you, that we will support you. The important things, you know, because Latinos yeah. like to like to talk about how you were very united or whatnot. But, you know, probably todo el mundo tiene un primo pato, todo el mundo tiene una prima pata, todo el mundo tiene maricones en la familia. But, you know, at the end of the day, you, tus tíos dicen homophobic jokes, racist jokes. And those are th the things we need to start attacking because people need to yeah. start understanding that it's not like, I don't care that it was a joke. It's not funny. I'm not going to laugh. And you're being like an asshole. That's what I feel needs to start happening. And uh, they are definitely uncomfortable conversations, just like, uh, us as white individuals or like people that are not black need to understand that it's up to like literally us to sit down and like talk about racism and how Absolutely. we perpetuate it, you know, because they don't have to educate us. Well, it's the, the exact same thing. Como que todas esas cosas convergen. Um, but I feel like that's where we need to start. And I feel like I talked a lot of shit, but it's also because, you know, like, well, I feel like these are the things that need to to be fixed, we have a lot of beautiful qualities. We are amazing. We are so resilient. We are like, honestly, I wouldn't be any other thing, but we need to also be real with ourselves. That's why yeah. I have like my issues with it. And I also like differentiate the fact that I, I also feel like I, I am Latina, but I'm also foremost a Caribbean woman. And that comes with its own set of like experiences and dynamics and power dynamics and colonization, etc. For sure. Speaking of about the Caribbean, I feel like Puerto Rico and its people have been leaders in breaking barriers for not just musicians, but I mean like society causes and, and a lot of different things that within the Latino community we try to address. With folks like, I think of just the top of my mind, Ricky Martin, Kanye Garcia, which you recently homenajeaste. Uh, I love her, Kanye is my baby. Kani, I love you Kanye so much. <laughs> <laughs> How important is it to have artists the, at okay. that level, uplifting, you know, our communities and being visible and, and outspoken, you know, within being like their identity of both Latin, Latinx and LGBTQ. You know, I think it's very beautiful and I think it's very, um, it's very empowering and all of that, but it's also, I see, I see, you know, and, and this is sadly just the way I'm ever always going to see it because I see it from the trans experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I also see, I see Kani and I see like how she so wonderfully uh, lives in her truth now. And I see Ricky Martin and I see the same thing, but I also see, and I remember as a Puerto Rican child, the uproar and the, you know, horror and like the bochinche that, that yeah. it was when everybody knew it and everybody, and like, what is the issue? Um, and to this day, you know, I feel like I feel very sorry that, you know, I'm never really going to know. And I feel like I feel this and I feel a lot of respect to my elder queers 
and to the people who are part of the queer community who are el my elders and are like of older generations because in a way although it was very hard for me and i come from a secluded place and i had a tough time as a queer woman and as a queer individual breaking into the world and you know i have my you know sob story or whatever the fuck you want to call it i know that it wasn't like half as bad as it probably was 20 30 years ago you know and even 10 years ago when Ricky Martin or Erkani came out or and, and you know I remember like the things they faced and I thank them so much and it, 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 it's a respect that runs so deep because now I probably don't see it I probably don't realize how this this strength that I have this me not giving a fuck this me being exactly who I am and like what are you gonna do about it yeah I probably owe it to them who took so much on you know and, and who took so like so much of that heat so that and in the same way I know that I will probably inspire like a generation of of uh trans girls who get it quicker like from the get-go you know what I'm saying like maybe they don't have to wait till they're 25 to realize that they're trans maybe they'll realize it when they're 12 maybe they'll realize it when they're 10. I knew when I was like a very little girl but it wasn't something that I could understand because I, I was not something talked about so you know I feel like I, I feel very honored that I'm there, but it's also, while I look at that, I also look at the cis privilege and I understand that, you know, Ricky Martin kept his career, but of course, Ricky Martin is a white man. He's in Puerto Rico, he's socialized and, you know, racialized as a white man. And, you know, nobody was going to take that away from him. Uh, and he does hold the privilege over, like, let's say, Kani, eh, who is uh, a cisgender woman. Uh, and, you know, they've both, handled it so beautifully and and I feel like Annie is so elegant uh about like everything and she's so committed she's like tied I know and I, I mean I can't speak um for Ricky because I don't necessarily like have the relationship with him that I have with Kani but I know Kani is like so given she's she worked with foundations she's like constantly there and she really really is an ally you know uh but you know the trans element is there and that's why it's rocked so many like people's mind because people still believe deep deep down somewhere that this shouldn't be happening or that like trans women are not like worthy or merecedora de, de conseguir su sueño or like get the things they want you know so there is a lot of resistance it's not like because they came along or yeah. because they were it, it's easier for me because i'm breaking another barrier that needed to be broken but obviously without them it, it wouldn't have been possible for sure i feel like we definitely stand on their shoulders even when it comes to like educating older generations as you've mentioned i have yeah. a and you know I, a, I feel like i feel like it's it's we're always going to stand on on each other's shoulders because i know that the generation that's coming is going to stand on minds to take it further and that's the beauty of it and that's what i feel like is so innate and so unique to the career community that we do this like our love is so big and it's so selfless that we fight for people we're never gonna know that we fight so that like a trans girl that is born possibly a hundred years from now can live a life of peace can yeah. die old can die of age and have things that most of us never had or could like even dream of having so it's always gonna be there and it's it, that's why to me it's like the most sacred thing in the world that's beautiful and definitely i feel like in real time we're watching and seeing that impact especially with you know la está rompiendo i feel like <laughs> 10 years ago we might not have that so it's beautiful we definitely would have not it's crazy you know? yeah yeah absolutely let's pivot, a a boy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> let's pivot a little bit into musica urbana and rap because it is una rapera you're you're a latin rap star Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's that like you mentioned right before this, right? It's a genre that historically, until today, as we've seen over the last month, um, continues to battle homophobia and machismo. Tell us yeah. a little bit about your experience as a rapper and, you know, how it has been to go into that space. Girl, girl. <laughs> wow. Well, it's a, it's, it's a complicated story, but let's get into that. Mira, yo pienso que I always like to talk about and I guess uh, say thank you to La Maldad. La Maldad is a collective, is a social collective in Puerto Rico um, that uh, is currently working with other queer acts such as Ana Macho. And they were the first 
who like were in the urban scene who believed in what I was doing. I had already made a name for myself. People knew that I rapped. Um, and I was just like, you know, the talk of the town. And um, La Maldad reached out to me, Michel Le Leon specifically, who will forever be my baby and I will forever be indebted to. He reached out to me, the ally that he is, uh, cis man. Um, and he said, listen, like, I don't know what your thing is. I don't know how you're recording, but I have a recording studio and I really like what you're doing. And I want you to like explore yourself further at my place and my studio, like with no charge and we'll just like work together and I'll produce your music. And um, that really like helped me, I guess, because I didn't have access to like a microphone, a Mac, um, Pro Tools. Uh, I really didn't. And people think it's like, you know, I, Puerto Rico is a third world country. Like, there's no doubt about it. And sometimes I, I might even like say lower than that if there is a classification as such. I don't know, but it's really like bad sometimes. And um, so this really helped me kind of like perfect my craft, is what I would say. And it was also the first instances of like me coming into a studio that's entirely filled with like macharrane and rappers and like this was like my first contact with like uh, a, a person who was uh, a cis male and like was in this urban cis male dominated space and was making a space for me let it be known Michel Le Leon is a black man and I do think that that is important and I do mm -hmm. think that that is like important to contextualize yes. um and he, he was yes and he was the first one who 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 like literally gave me a helping hand and said, you know, I want to, I, I believe, I believe in you and I want to see you, like, I want to see where you take this. Later, while well, things developed and like, you know, like people appeared that wanted to sign me and whatever, and I got signed and all of that jazz. But like me having that, like first, like making a name for myself was entirely with La Maldad. And I, I, I thank them for the, for that so much. Um, and I always talk about it and they're still working with other queer artists, which is like the beautiful thing to me. Like it's more than just like, you know, like it was more than just like seeing, oh, you have potential, we can make money off of this. It was like, I think that like regardless of who or what you identify as, you deserve a space to develop your talent. And he gave that to me. With regards to like the industry, el machismo como tal, I have to say that that was like my little safe space bubble. It was literally a safe space. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing to like also say. Right. Well, um, I remember for you to cultivate your talent and your creative expression. And then, you know, when I was already just solid and they were like, oh shit, you know, <laughs> she's spitting, <laughs> she's spitting bars, like she's really doing it. Well, it was like, at that point I realized como que yo no necesito um, que me la den porque es que no me la van a dar. Like, in Puerto Rico también, we have a problem where, and, and traveling has, like, opened my eyes to this as well. We have a problem with, like, um, with ourselves, and we're very critical of ourselves, and we're very, like, we, we, we want to tear each other down, and we want to, like, we're very, and I feel like that happens in todos los países, como que internamente, we're, like, so hard on each other. Yeah. And... Puerto Rico habla mucha mierda. Yo sabía absolutamente que a mí nunca me la iban a dar, que ninguna... Y también tengo que decir, let this be known, que la primera persona que a mí sí, como quien dice, me la dio. Ahora, I, I do make the, like, salvedad, que no me la dio en el sentido de que he helped me, or that, like, he said, let's hop on a song together, because I feel like that is also something that is, like, you know, lending a hand, yeah. but that's not what happened. But, you know, it was still, like, it, it was still a, a very, very beautiful gesture, and I appreciate it so much. Nejo, um posted about me and he was like oh my god like this person like is really dope like they're a really dope artist obviously there i was like starting transitions so there were like mix-ups as to what to call me or whatnot but they were just like you know whatever whatever you are <laughs> you're very good and that definitely like um also like solidified me even more up until the point where i just blew up a little bit and PRN, you know, like I collaborated with like other acts, um, like Young Miko, right now, just like a generation of queer women who are coming up and yeah. are taking things to a newer level. But 
I've had like horrible experiences with uh, machismo in the industry. I feel like every day I have to go in and be talked to as if I am not a producer, or as if I don't know how to produce, as if, um, you know, every day is like you have to prove these things to these people. And men never do. It's like, and they'll come in and they'll half ass and they'll never have like actually trained in any of this. But, you know, they got the gig and they're half assing their way through it. Yeah. That's that male privilege um, that comes with that. But I don't know, like for me, I see it every day and I see it like with the females, like the first thing, like when I started running into like important females and not even like just like famous like artists or anything, just like important like public figures of Puerto Rico who were like in the industry, they were like, babe, come here. And they pulled me aside and they were like, listen, pull yourself, like, so what they're panting, mommy, because it's it's really ugly in here, and you know these mm-hmm. these men are like this and like that, and they they really like I guess coached me in a way or like um, warned me of the dangers ahead. I was ready for them, and I and I faced them, but you know I I can't say that I did it entirely alone. I had a network of women, and I still do. I have friends who are like constantly, you know, I'm I might not have talked to them in like six months because I haven't been home, but they're constantly texting me like, bitch, we're, we're rooting for you because like, you're taking this further than like any of us could have ever dreamed. And that keeps me going. So I don't feel like I faced it alone. Yeah, I'm happy you touch on that because I actually noticed that you've collaborated collaborated with a lot of women in Musica Urbana, not just Young Miko, Pao Pao, you did, uh, it was like a female collab EP, you know, can you t- elaborate a little bit more on like women really helping uplift the community and how that inter- intersectionality has supported your career. It's been beautiful. Like, um, I feel like not even just in the industry, you know, I've had I've had cis women stand up for me in situations where like, it's just a random like girl that mm-hmm. I've never met. I was once at a store like, and I was, it was a store for, <laughs> this is the most Latinx thing I'm going to say. I was going to buy a faja. That's what you this know. This is the most Latino thing ever. So I'm going to buy a faja in the tienda. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm asking this girl, like, what the sizes are and whatnot. And she entirely misgenders me. And I was, like, just kind of, like, taken aback a bit. And there were just, like, two seconds there, like, like 0.5 microseconds of, like, this silence until I react. And this girl came out of nowhere out of nowhere i swear she was like hiding in some like i don't know but and she like literally like intersect like interjected her and like called me like a, a woman she's like like Mi amor, chica, esto y lo otro. like she corrected her she didn't even and I, like not even like she didn't even she didn't stop to say like hey you misgendered her. no she just like came in and she gendered me correctly and it was so affirming to me i was like in shock i was like and she knew what she was doing you know yeah, she yeah. knew that she was like kind of like saving me from that you know from having mm-hmm. to like you know go through trip. and she left and i never saw her again she said you're beautiful whatever whatever and she left and she said compró su faja y se fue. and you know i feel like that to me is like the beauty of like feminism, you know, and like inclusivity and like how we really help each other and how we're really just on the same team. And yeah. to me, Bao Bao, specifically Bao Bao, who is the the artist who organized um, el, el, el LP de Embrismo, um, and the fact that she like reached out and was like, listen, like I want you on here with like four other cis girls, um, that is allyship, you know what I'm saying? Because she yeah. could have, she could have ignored me. She could have been like, no, we're getting another cis girl. We're getting another cis Puerto Rican. But she fucked with, she fucks with my music and like, I love her. I consider her my friend. And not only that, that came later, you know, that like that relationship we developed later. But one of the things that I did notice was like, we were all so eager to work. We were also like down to get it done. Each and every one of those girls, like La Gaby, Cami the Baby, Aria Vega, each and every one of them were like puesta para el problema. They wanted to work. They wanted to get it done. But there were several roadblocks along the way because wow. what happens? We were all female artists, and 
Pau Pau produce, yo produzco, but you know, this was Streets Music and like they had their producers and whatnot and their producers were men. And I'm so not shading this music. I love Streets Music. I want to say this. They're a wonderful uh, label. Um, I'm not in any way, shape or form shading them. This is something that has to do with men and it happens in all labels. So um, what happened was the producers that they like assigned for us and would not wake up until like 10 p.m., to work so we would spend all day just looking at each other's faces wanting to work being eager to work but not being able to go to the studio because the producers weren't available um and i do say this like with the utmost respect and i do use the word whore with the utmost respect i am a sex worker and well former sex worker because this kicked off and i haven't even had time for that or the need to because i used to do it out of like necessity um and Lord knows, like, I made so many friends in Colombia who are sex workers because I used to, like, at the end, I was like, mira, pues yo voy a ir también porque si yo voy a pues yo voy. Y me hacía amiga de todas. Hubo una que me acuerdo que me preguntó. She was, like, very respectful. She was like, listen, um, are you with any of these guys? And I was like, no, babe. So she comes over. She's like, which one of them has the most money? I'm like, that one. Take <laughs> everything he has. And she went. So um, I saw that. We were very eager to work. We were very eager to, like, you know, like, get it done but even then we had an impediment yeah you we had went. obstacles because i'm pretty sure that if it had been like all female producers we could have probably made it like two albums we, we had the time it was yeah. just that well male diversions yeah talking about male allies bad bunny brought you out at the Choli, sold out mm -hmm. puerto rico tell me a little bit about the importance of having people like him that have that much power and visibility to shine light not only on you as a art a rapera que la está rompiendo in the island, but also other females in you know such a historic tour that he's having on. Um, I think it's important that uh, we we also state that it was three queer women because right now Young Miko and I are all three queer women and that speaks volumes yeah um in our own different ways of course in our own different intersectionalities in our own different like labels uh, or non-labels but we are queer women um i think that it's a wonderful question but i would also like to see him be asked this question because i feel mm -hmm. that we get it a lot but we've never really had his take on it Flip so i don't know Right. I feel like I want to know. I feel like what's going like through his mind. But definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, the impact is is there. And you know, like I was I was there on the first night. So it was the night that it was broadcast and it was the night that it was it reached like millions of, of homes. And I know that I got on that stage and millions of families were taken aback and possibly hundreds of thousands of families looked at a child that they have amongst themselves and saw someone that represents that child yeah in some way shape or form because that child does not fit in the cis -hetero heteropatriarchy that exists so um i feel like using that platform for that is an admirable an admirable thing to do but bad bunny has always done admirable things i feel like um that's the thing i personally feel like anyone who is a bad bunny hater at this point it's just like i don't know like there must be something wrong because <laughs> if you don't like the music you must definitely like what like what he does for puerto rico and and that was like the the brief instances that we've um talked i've always just said that like thank you for what you've done for our con for like nuestro país yeah because i feel like there is and i do want to make this clear i do not consider puerto rico no es parte de los estados unidos when i talk about mi país or my country i am not talking about the united states of america i am talking about puerto rico um and i feel like that that pride is something that you know like regardless of who you are if you're puerto rican you have to fuck with bad bunnies at this point it's like it's a, it's a deal breaker <laughs> it's a deal breaker now. you're asking to get jump. no don't say like and even if you don't like the music like just everything yeah. like he's he's done wonderful things with this platform i feel like can he do more of course like there's always room for for like improvement but it's very wonderful to see someone with so much power move towards the light, you know, and towards uh, love and towards equity and towards compassion and towards all the things that are really so scarce in the world. And I feel like that's why a lot of people 
really love him and, and have such a deep like respect or just like como este, like como este amor, you know like because just like you're doing you're, you're doing something good regardless of how regardless de que sea let la gente habla que si letras vulgares que si esto y lo otro that person has done so much more for society than all of these people that go to church on Sundays and like speak hate the rest of the week um but so when- you know it it was an honor for me to, to to be there, definitely. But I feel like these are the things that need to happen. And I'm very happy that he's stepping up to the plate of allyship and doing it correctly. What What did you feel when you got on stage and you heard? Because I could hear, I was watching a live stream on YouTube that had like 40,000 people. I was in New York. It was 2 a.m. I had to be up at 6 a.m. Like, And I'm listening to everybody try to keep up with you because it's a very hard song to keep up to. Like, what did you feel in that moment? Do you feel like... Uh, did anything change inside of you of like, man, like I need to reach bigger or get this que sentiste tú en ese momento? You know, I don't remember like any of it. I don't remember like being on the stage, but I hear like that happens a lot. And I've talked to other artists that like have had similar experiences. Uh, I remember some like bits of it, but I always say this, like, you know, I don't there are very few times obviously i'm a human being sometimes i get anxious sometimes i get nervous but it's also very rare because i have this mindset and this mentality i was already there i'm already there there's already 20,000 people in this stadium so no matter what happens i have to get on that stage what am i going to get from being a nervous wreck or from being like you know like i don't know like just all over the place there was a thing where like with with the I had never been in like a crowd that was that huge. So there was like mm-hmm. some some like feedback and my ears gave me a little bit of of trouble. So there was like I, I didn't really like I couldn't really listen very well to myself, but just the experience and me, I was like writing the B and just like everything. I knew I knew what it meant, but it's also like I don't really think that I, I necessarily thought like, oh, I need to I need to take it bigger or I need to like do more because I know that I do 30 times more than like any mm-hmm. other rapper out there because I have to, because I've not, I'm not even going to be considered. Like I literally had to like pull my own seat and sit at the table, like forcibly. I fought for that place there and I constantly have to defend it because, you know, there's a lot of like forces that would like me not to have it. And a lot of people that think right. that like, I just should not be allowed to like even have a platform that big or should not be allowed to like reach, um, I don't know, like children. So I think of all these things that like are wrong in the world. And I also kind of like just get bitter and I'm like, you know, this is my fucking right to be here. So yeah, I'm here next to Bad Bunny. Yes. Talk, talking about good. that, talking about that. The song, the session where we set up, the first artist was trans to chart top 50 in the Spotify global charts. También estabas YouTube charts, YouTube music, charting globally. The, it's a record that Bizarrap is partly on a house beat. And as you know, house music comes from the Black queer community. Its foundations are in that community. Have you had a yes. moment to really think about how that beat uh, even allowed you to have like your voice heard around the world because that record to this day is one of the top songs out right now. Totally, because like when we sat down and make this song, like the song came to be exactly because I told Bizarrap that I grew up on house music and like the scene that saw me like basically transform into the person I am today and even transition was the house scene because that's the music that I I loved but it's also the music that had a scene that was the most accepting not necessarily because they were like you know very informed or because they were educated or because it was just because it was people that didn't really give a fuck who you were. They didn't really care. It was, we're all here, we're dancing, we're having a good time. We're partially on ecstasy, but you know, we're just having fun. And yeah. this, this, this like sense of like, I don't know, like connection and just like feeling what matters, like, and just seeing and, and seeing what doesn't matter was very like there. And house is also very, very, very present in Puerto Rico. Like we had, 
before obviously all of the, the devastation that has occurred to Puerto Rico since 2017, which is the last recollection I can have of a normal life in Puerto Rico, normal. Um, but 2017 was when Maria hit and life changed for us forever because after that it was just, you know, Maria, um, the fact that like we couldn't recover because of the fact that we're a colony and we're subject to so many like inhumane things, cutbacks on things, our health depart our health system entirely collapsed, our education system collapsed, uh, earthquakes, more hurricanes, um, absolutely everything, the pandemic, uh, everything just came at us. And there was a massive exodus of people who left Puerto Rico. So the house scene sort of like has disintegrated in a way. It's still very there. It's still very present. And I'm talking about like underground house scene, yeah, yeah, like yeah. illegal beach parties, like tiroteo, policia. This is like the OG stuff. So <laughs> uh, because, you know, this, this music is always like criminalized and reggaeton was entirely criminalized at one point too. Yeah. But this was for other things. This was criminalized for other things. Um, so for me, house music is very, 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 very important. It's like one of the pillars of who I am, honestly. And, uh, we got to talking about that. And then like, uh, obviously Bisa also loves house and we ended up creating a dance record. I think it's more dance than house personally, but you know, those are very much like umbrella terms and they're in the same family, for but sure, sure. absolutely. All right, awesome. At this moment, we are gonna be taking some questions from the folks in the audience. So can we see the first question? Thank you so much for coming today, Viana. Based on your life experiences, what advice would you give to your younger self? Thank you, Farah. Oh my God, thank you, Farah. Um, I think about this a lot <laughs> because just, just earlier today, I was thinking about like, they asked me a question. They were like, if I would want to talk to some like my 15 year old self or my 40 year old self obviously mm -hmm. i chose my 40 year old self because i feel like my 40 year old self is gonna be able to tell me like listen do this don't do that um 15 well like i would be the one giving the advice and i feel still like i, I still need like advice i feel like i still feel like you know advice is something that i would want <laughs> especially from me um to my younger self you know I would say cry, like maybe cry a little bit less, mommy. Things are gonna be okay. Come on, okay. I had a really tough time just like accepting a lot of things and like um the world is a very cruel place. It really is. And that's not a lie, and that's not me trying to be pessimistic. It's me being a realist. The world is a very, very cruel and humane place. And above it all, I'm very happy that I managed to stay soft, but I also learned how to like build an armor and you definitely need an armor to live in this world you know not everyone can have access to your essence to like who you are because that's sacred stuff you know and if you go out giving it there's a lot of people who don't know what that is or don't have that and they cling to you and they want to take it from you and if they don't they want to like at least like yeah. so um i learned that like with through very hard lessons in life but when I was younger, you know, I was 17 and, and like things hurt a lot more. And I just wish I would have like built that shell a little bit quicker because I'm having so much fun now. And like I can like I can really, really, really bask in that like I am a bad bitch and nobody can tell me absolutely anything. And whatever anybody says doesn't matter because they're not me. And like I'm doing my thing and it's so great and I'm living an amazing life that I manifested and I worked for and I earned so um you know i would feel like saying something like it's gonna be okay chill out smoke a blunt <laughs> um and you're gonna be fine okay right. another question out there what is your creative process like do these things have any meaning to you love your music can't wait to hear more thank you ricardo um, my creative process is very varied and it depends on what I'm doing. I'm not really going to lie. I've, um, as an artist and as a human being experimented with a lot of substances, um, psychedelics mainly. And I feel like I've written a lot of powerful stuff while on shrooms or yeah, if I haven't written them on the trip, I've, um, had very, very, very intense, um, experiences that have like 
inched me closer to I feel like this magic fiber that is within us. Um, within us, I mean artists, musicians, people who who innately create. Because no matter what I'm doing in my life, I'm always creating something. I'm always making something. Um, from scratch or building on something else, but I am an artist and I am a very, very, very uh, creative person. So um, I do drugs sometimes, <laughs> but mainly stuff like that. I'm also like very, you know, I, I smoke weed um, and shrooms. I now at this point of my life, I limit it to that, but I feel like it's also a close, like closely, what makes me closer to the earth. Sometimes my English, you know, like, comes and goes because yo soy puertorriqueña, yo lo aprendí empujado. So, no lo hablo empujado. <laughs> Los um, English. Sí, sí, sí. So, I feel like these things connect me to the earth and I feel like that as a Caribbean woman and as a Puerto Rican person, I am very connected to my island and I am very, I, I feel like this is one thing that I will say here. Um, Puerto Rico is living a horrible thing, you know, besides all of the devastation that I already mentioned, we're living the fact that we are being, um, pushed out of our own country by people from the United States who are coming in and just like, like birds preying on a carcass, um, buying properties and just making huge Airbnbs and like displacing entire communities, this famous gentrification, which is happening all over the world. Um, Puerto Rico is being entirely, entirely wiped out by that. And uh, the United States did it to Hawaii and they're currently doing it to Puerto Rico. They're still doing it to Hawaii. I feel like Hawaii and Puerto Rico are cousins in that decolonization dream, in my in my opinion. And we're also people who are Islanders and we know, at least in my opinion, and maybe this will reach out to some Hawaiian and they, they feel the same. Uh, I feel like the earth, Puerto Rico, like the land does not recognize Americans, gringos, does not recognize people who come here and flee when a hurricane comes because they don't know what to do when a hurricane comes because they don't understand the earth. They can't see the signs. They can't know. You know, we have nowhere to go because this is our land. This is our home. We stay. Whatever comes, we stay. And it's one of the reasons, and I get very emotional because it's a very big thing for me. But um, one of the reasons I still haven't left Puerto Rico is because I, I don't know how. And it's a very particular pain. And I feel like that also affects my creative process. As a trans woman, I took 25 years in, in, into understanding that I could be sovereign within myself. And I am almost certain that it is because I did not grow up in a sovereign nation. I did not understand sovereignty. You know, those things tie together. And I've thought about this a lot. And all of that blends into my creative process because... I do these substances to like connect with my home. So I go to the beach, I go to the rivers. I, I've seen things in Puerto Rico that only Puerto Ricans know. And I've connected in a way that only Puerto Ricans can connect and have access to. I have access to the real Puerto Rico. So, and the people. So yeah. my creative process is, is definitely very Puerto Rican, very Caribbean. And there must be something in it because a lot of Puerto Ricans are killing it. So... <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that story with us. I think we have time for one more question very quickly. Many of us realize we're Latines when we leave our countries. When did you recognize yourself as a Latine? What does it mean for you to be Latine? Mm, right, well, this kind of touches back on what I was saying of um, me not necessarily identifying with the term Latine entirely, although I do understand myself as a uh, Latina woman when you know when i went out into the world and i realized that that is what the world would categorize me as mm -hmm. um but i also do always state that i am a caribbean person before i am a latina person um i am both of those things and those things coexist um i feel like the first time i kind of like realized that i was because obviously in puerto rico like we don't talk about it and i feel like in any country like where you're Latino, you don't talk about it because first off, you're just probably trying to survive because <laughs> it's crazy. Um, second of all, like, it's not necessarily a thing that's talked about Latinidad is something that has like very recently begun to like, although like, I, I, I feel like been, be studied in my view, I could be wrong because I'm not a scholar <laughs> on these <laughs> subjects, but you know, I don't really remember. 
when was the first time I felt categorized as like Latine or when I saw myself as that. Um, I just know, I, I knew that I wasn't a gringa for fucking sure. Um, and I knew that, I, that there was a lot of resistance, you know, like towards uh, a lot of things. In Puerto Rico, we resist a lot of things and we're very like overzealous even towards like the rest of the Latino community because I feel like we're so hurt in our ego that, you know, we have this problem that we have, that we have been kidnapped by the United States. Um, oh my God, now Google's probably going to like, blacklist <laughs> me for saying all of this. But it had to be said. Um, you know, no, uh, gracias. Gracias it, it, this, but this is my experience, you know, as, as, as a Puerto Rican woman. So, yo no sé, en verdad, yo pienso que, I, I can't really recall when was the first time that I recalled being like, um, Latine, I just knew I was Boricua. Eso fue lo, lo, lo primero que yo recuerdo es, yo soy Boricua, para que tú lo sepas. That's like this thing de mi infancia que recuerdo mucho. Sí. Later, obviously, pues cuando uno, cuando uno viaja y uno se da cuenta de cómo nos tratan a todos, independientemente de dónde seamos, de por nuestras facciones, de por cómo hablamos español, de por qué. Ah, porque ahora es cool el, el español de Puerto Rico, pero antes tú no sabes hablar esto y lo otro, y ahora, ahora hasta se copian de las palabras de, la palabra de nosotros. Entonces, you know, todo es cíclico, yo pienso. Eh, a mí me encanta como yo hablo el español, y me recuerda a mis abuelas, y yo hablo el español bien comido, y hablo en parábolas y en refranes, porque así fue que me lo enseñaron a hablar a mí, y lo hablo, lo hablo tirado. Um, pero creo que al ver como, like, how, how, like, other Latinos are treated, is when, like, you feel a sense of, like, community because you get treated yeah. the same. And it's like, okay, so, like, they're labeling us the same, but, like, we're we're in this together, you know? And that has a lot to do with them and not so much to do with us. For sure. No, well, thank you so much. I think you've shared a lot of powerful stories. And, and I think a lot of us that have been here listening to you, you know, just have a sense of, you know, really – you are a barrier breaker. Everything that you've done up to today has been breaking some sort of ceiling because like you mentioned, you are the first one that a lot of us have seen, you know, at a at a level outside of the island um, and beyond. I mean, I'm saying that we can do one more question. Let, let's get it. Let's, let's, let's get it. Let's get it. Gracias por hablar de PR, de ti, de las verdades de tu vida y de la colonia. Uno, te amo. Dos, ¿En qué mensajes te vas a enfocar en tu álbum que viene por ahí? Qué rico. Gracias por esa pregunta, Sofía. Eh, te amo también. Eh, mira, mi álbum um, se llama La Sustancia X. Y um, if you don't understand like the reference, like La Sustancia X, it was what in theory made the power of girls super. So I feel like it's me giving superpowers to a bunch of like young people that are going to listen to me. And the thematic is basically el activismo existil. You know, I'm no longer interested in making, I mean, I haven't been for a while and that's the beauty of it, but I am very much uninterested in making music that appeals to a conscience or that seeks to educate or that seeks to be correct because I'm not that person and I don't have to be. So yeah. I'm really just making music about being a bad bitch and being with my friends and doing drugs and, you know, surviving and doing sex work and all of the things that I had to do to stay alive and how I made that my knife and my weapon. So I very much focused on that and I did what all the other men do and I made very vulgar music, but it's music that connects and it's music that reminds women that they can be themselves, that they can be in their element, that they can be just as bad, that they don't have to smile, that they don't have to like talk a certain way or like behave a certain way. Um, and it's very, 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 very old school reggaeton based. There are a lot of sounds that like, I feel like came out of me as a producer. Um, because I have like una cuna, you know, and it's reggaeton. Like I grew up listening to reggaeton in the golden age of reggaeton. Teo Calderon, Hector El Fader, Ivy Queen, Don Omar, Daddy Yankee, you know, all of those things. So, esa, esas raíces para mí están ahí, but it also comes with a twist and it comes with a new sound and it comes with me being a trans woman and it comes with all of these other aesthetics and like sound designs that I've 
like been open to learning about and that have also been inherited to me because queer people make music a different way. And you can see that with uh, producers like Arca even, uh, who is another trans woman who's like breaking amazing barriers and is also yes. Latina. Yes. Um, so, you know, what can I say? You know, it's, it's, the, it's the base of the old. And I guess like, I'm gonna say this in a very controversial way, but like, I guess maybe the base of like that old testament in a way, but with all of the new upgraded iOS and very in your face. <laughs> wow, no, no. Que palabras tan poderosas, la verdad. It's, it's beautiful. I feel like you're right. It's like a new foundation, right? The beginning of, it's not, it might not even be the beginning because like you mentioned, there's, we're, you know, standing on the shoulders of those that have been here before us, but I feel like this is not ending here. We're going to continue to see more and more voices, especially with people like you that are leading and being so strong and unapologetic and, you know, being present. Um, so thank you so much for sharing everything today. I'm going to give the mic to you, the mic to you as we exit out. And I just want you to tell us some final words very quickly and maybe a few sentences. People that are looking at you are like, wow, me veo en ti. I see myself in you in a place that maybe they don't see themselves. To, to go out with a bang, can you share some words of inspiration for those people that may be watching this? And think, what, how can I, how can I be my true, genuine self in this world? Right. Thank you for the question. It sounds really cliche, but literally, hold on to yourself and stick to your essence. You are loved. You're gonna find. You're gonna grow up. You're gonna be able to leave whatever town you're in. You're gonna be able to leave whatever país you're in. You're gonna be able to live a life some way, somehow, somewhere where you're valid, where you are loved, where you have opportunities. I like 100% guarantee that to you. Stay in it. The world is changing, we are changing it. And I can't change it alone. And no other artist, no other queer artist can change it alone. We are inching the world to a different, like to a different situation, to a higher like vibrational level together. It's not something that can be done by one person. No, no artist is single-handedly gonna do that. We all need to collectively move there and we can't do it without you and you're valid and you're loved just the way you are however that way may be period that's like the only thing i can tell each and every one of you and that i love you i personally love you y le mando un beso y un abrazo. this has been villana villano and diano for talks at google thank you <laughs>